Now, when you hear somebody say, well, that was kind of different, or even, oh, that guy, yeah, he's kind of different, is that positive or negative? Negative, of course. It's kind of like saying, well, that was a little weird, or that guy's a little on the weird side. But you know, one of the main things that God wants us to know about him is that he is different. Only, we usually say he's holy. But that means, the word holy means different. It means set apart. It means separate from what is normal. Separate from what is common. It means different. But it is, in this case, something that's positive about God. Something that can bring us to him, not away from him. And we're going to see how a king of Judah, Uzziah, didn't appreciate the holiness of God. And how when we see God's holiness and respond well to it, uh, how that is a good thing. And so how we can do that. Well, last week, we looked at a king by the name of Azariah, Uzziah's father. And he started his reign really well by being obedient to God and trusting for his help. On the one hand, God helped them defeat the Edomites, who were enemies of the nation. And then, on the other hand, Amaziah turns around and brings the idols, the false gods of the Edomites, home with him after the war. And he starts to worship them. Well, God sends a prophet to rebuke him and talk sense into the king, but he just rejects it outright. He rejects it completely. And in time, Amaziah is killed off by his own people. They assassinate him because of his departure from serving God. So we get introduced to Uzziah in Second uh, Chronicles 26. Uzziah, the son of Amaziah, is yet another king who started well, but ended badly. He ended badly because he thought too much of himself and, and misunderstood, or underestimated, I should say. He underestimated God's holiness. Let's pick up in verse 1. And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. So by the way, if you read the book of Kings, um, Uzziah, and you see him there, he's actually called Azariah. So don't get confused. It's actually a Hebrew variant of the same name of Uzziah. So how did he do? Verse 4. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Now that little proviso doesn't sound that good to me. Because if we remember right from last week, if you, or even just from what I told you, he started well, but did not end well. Well, let's see how Uzziah does. Verse 5, it continues. It says, He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now, right off, I was wondering, who's Zechariah? Is that the prophet Zechariah? No, he actually lived a fair bit later. We actually don't know. We don't have a clue who this Zechariah guy is. We only know that, as it says there, he instructed him in the fear of the Lord. That's pretty important. That sounds a lot like Joash a couple kings ago, um, who only did, as, did well as long as the high priest was kind of instructing him and, uh, and uh, helping him along. There's a lot of people, though, like Zechariah, who lived over the centuries, that are in the Bible or not in the Bible, even us, Solid, faithful followers of God, living quietly, doing what God wants, not famous, but important to God because they were faithful. This Zechariah has a better reputation in the Bible than King Uzziah does because of his faithfulness there to instruct in the fear of the Lord. It's a good example for us to live in the same kind of quiet, faithful way. Well, because of, as it says there, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Uzziah did some work, and uh, he did some really good stuff. We're not going to go over verses 6 to 15, uh, but I'm going to mention what happens there. We're told of the good things that Uzziah did for the nation. And all of these show that God was helping him. He was favoring him as long as, as Uzziah was faithfully serving the Lord. As it says there, that God made him prosper. In verses 6 to 8, it tells us how he was, faithful, how he was able to subdue neighboring enemies. Verse 7 specifically states that God helped him. That's very important. 
Verse 9 and 10 tell of the construction projects that, that he did, that he, he strengthened major infra infrastructure among the nation, as well as how he extensively worked in agriculture. He had all sorts of stuff going on. Now, of a historical note, we're told in the books of Amos and in the book of Zechariah that there was a major earthquake during the reign of Uzziah. And there would have been major reconstruction to do. And from archaeological evidence, we know that that is exactly right. We see the evidence of that major earthquake. Verse 11 and to 15 tell of the development of his military, the different things that he did there. And then the end of verse 15 sums it all up with, And his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Marvelously helped. If you think of last week, if you had heard that message, it said that God has power to help or to cast down. God was helping Uzziah in all these ways. He was strengthening the country. God made him strong. But as it says there, he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Uzziah gets proud and underestimates the holiness of God. Verses 16. And when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now that on the outside doesn't sound really all that serious, but we'll come back to why that was. But it says there, when he, grew, when he was strong, he grew proud. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, no one thinks, hey, I'm the best loser there is. Or, hey, no one's as useless as me. You're never proud of what you can't do, are you? When we're strong in anything, we need to be careful of putting ourselves higher than others, of being proud, prideful in some ways. When the farm is doing really well, it's, you need to be careful that we don't say, I don't need God to provide. I have a great job. I don't need what God needs. We need to be careful of that. I'm in great shape. I'm strong. I'm healthy. I can do anything that I want. I'm smart. I can figure out all by, on my own. I know better than those guys. I've got my life together. I know, what it, I, I know what the Bible says. I'm not wrong. Now that's spiritual pride. That's a whole other thing. Pride is self-confidence. That I can do something on my own that I am capable. Now being confident and capable is actually a pretty good thing. We need, to, we need that in a lot of the things we do. And it's a gift of God to us to be skillful at things. But when it turns to superiority, to putting yourself above others for any reason... That's pride. At the same time, when we think that we're great because of our achievements, that we alone got ourselves to that superior level, whatever it is, that's also pride. And pride turns us away from God. And that's the big problem with it. We don't need him. We don't depend on him. We've got it all under control. Proverbs 6.18 Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So how did Uzziah get so strong? It says there actually God helped him. It says he was marvelously helped. So how do we get skillful? How do we get capable at the things that, that God has made us good at? Because God has enabled us. He has made us who we are. We have nothing to be proud about in a lot of ways. It is God's help that, and strength that helps us. But now, in his strength and pride, Uzziah steps out to do something that verse 16 says that he was unfaithful to the Lord in verse 16. Now, unfaithful, that's actually a key word. It means an act of, to act in violation of what you know would be faithful. You are violating what you know is faithful, or to act not in keeping with what you know that how God would like you to act. You're being unfaithful to what you know better. So really, what was so wrong with what Uzziah did by going into the temple to burn incense? Because it was a violation of God's holiness. It was a violation of God's holiness. Now, if we don't understand that, I think you will as we look at it. The pride of Uzziah was so great, though, that he thought that his way was above God's and what God had commanded. And by the way, anytime we sin, that we disobey God, it's really doing the same thing. When you think about it, sin is going against what God says is right. And when we sin, it's like saying what I want is better than what God says. Putting our desires, our ideas above God in some way. 
Well, let's see what God, sorry, let's see what we are told of how the priests, first of all, reprimanded Uzziah in verse 17. It says, But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, for the sons of Aaron who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Now these priests, it says right off the bat, were men of valor. Now that's often used with like soldiers, with mighty men. Well, they had to be men of valor. These guys were brave. It was their duty to warn the king because he was not in his place. And it could have cost them their lives. There were some kings that they would have just axed them immediately if they had done that. And they were taking their lives in their hands. So they had to be brave. But again, what was the matter? What did these guys say? He said, they said, first of all, it is not for you. It is for the priests. It is not for you, but for the priests. And you have done wrong. That you have done wrong is the same Hebrew word as unfaithful that we looked at earlier. Violation of something you know. Now, Azariah had said that the priests were consecrated. Consecrated to burn the incense. That means they are set apart, dedicated by God to do that duty. The Hebrew word for holy, it's an interesting word, um, That word is the root word for the word consecrated. It means set apart by God for a purpose. They are separate. They are different. Doing things that not everybody was allowed to do. Consecrated. Now, we're going to look in Exodus here and look at some of the commands God gave about the priesthood. And you'll see just how serious a violation this was. Exodus 30 verse 1 God said to Moses, you shall make an altar on which to burn incense, and you shall make it of acacia wood. Verse 9, you shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a green offering, and you shall not, not pour a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on his horns once a year. With the blood of the sin offering of the atonement, he shall make atonement on it, on, for it once a year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Now, most holy means that the priests must be most careful with it. Don't fool around there. Here's a little diagram. This is actually a tabernacle, not the temple, but the inside of the temple was arranged in the same way. You can see the veil at the back with the Ark of the Covenant there. And right in front of it, there's this little square dealie. That is the altar of incense that we're talking about. That was right in front of the veil right before the Holy of Holies. That was called the Holy Place. Inside the veil of the Ark of the Covenant was the Holy of Holies. Inside that Holy of Holies, the priest only went once a year, period, on the Day of Atonement. But on that little altar in front, that's where Aaron put the blood of that on that Day of Atonement. That's how important that altar was. And that's why they were said that it was most holy to the Lord. Now, back in Leviticus, we have an example of two sons of Aaron who were not careful in how they offered incense. They decided to experiment and to bring a kind of incense offering that God didn't prescribe. It says that fire came out from before the Lord and killed them instantly, came out from that Holy of Holies and killed them. And this is what Moses said about that incident to to Aaron, their father, in Leviticus 10.3. Then Moses said to Aaron, it's what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. The temple, the tabernacle, and the priests, they're all an illustration of God's holiness. That God is set apart, separate from us, in purity, in goodness, in righteousness, from all people. He is different than us. And the people, he set apart in his purity, goodness, and righteousness before people who are impure, sinful, and unrighteous. God's nature is that he is so pure, he is repulsed by what is impure, by what we consider dirty or unrighteous. But God wants to have relationships with the people that he made. So he made himself accessible. But through that tabernacle of the temple, that was in a limited way. You had to go through the temple. You had to go through the priests who were set apart. 
And they were able to come to God on our behalf, bringing offerings and sacrifices. And that's what God had provided. Numbers 18, 7 says this. You and your sons, he's talking to Aaron, they are the priest. You're with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and not all that is within the veil. You shall serve. I give your priesthood as a gift and any outsider who comes near shall be what? Put to death. You can see how serious a violation it was for Uzziah to go into the temple himself to offer incense before God on that incense altar. He actually deserved to die for what he did. If fire came out from God and killed him, that would have been just from God. Uzziah was not only taking over the priest's role, he was ignoring God's holiness. So when we think about that, what is our reaction to God's holiness? When you learn and you see this is the kind of God he is, does that make you angry? For some people it does. Does that leave you in awe? Awe of a pure, righteous God. Believe me, if you could see God in some way like that, it would bring you into awe. But how aware are we of God's holiness? When I was studying this, I sat outside for a little bit and was looking around me and thinking, how much am I aware sitting here of God's holiness? Not much. I'm seeing, I'm seeing neat things. I'm seeing grass, birds, the, the hills in the distance. But it doesn't really make me think much about God's holiness unless I think to who was behind that. That someone separate from me who was way stronger than me could make that. And that shows me God's holiness. But often we don't tend to think of that. We don't tend to think of God as holy. We, we often think about him on human terms, in, humans way, in human ways. And that isn't a good thing to do. In our imperfections, it's pretty hard to fathom perfection. To fathom a being that is set apart and above us in our daily activities as we're going about our daily activities and our concerns. His holiness often really doesn't enter our minds. But it can. When we see God's creation around us, like I said, it reminds us that God made it, we didn't, and that God is separate, that he is different from us, and he deserves our worship, and he deserves our reverence. So what happened to Uzziah? Well, Uzziah is struck. And we'll see how did Uzziah take the reprimand from the priest. The priest reprimanded, how did he take that? Verse 19, then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him and behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly and he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. I bet he did. God was still gracious though when you think about it. Uzziah should have died. But instead, he was given a very visible discipline, leprosy, a, a dreaded skin disease that makes you an instant outcast in that society. You notice that God, though, waits until the king gets angry. He shows what was in his heart. He resists the priest's warning, and then God strikes him. Now, we don't know what, what would have happened if he had repented, but the fact is he didn't. His angry reaction shows us how proud and arrogant he really actually was. God lets Uzziah know under no uncertain terms that he has violated his holiness. So now he's quick to get out of the temple lest something even worse happen to him. Verse 21. We'll carry on from there. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper lived in a separate house for he was excluded from the house of the Lord and Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. Now, being a leper meant that he was excluded from any interaction with people in society. He had to be totally separate. And so he was. So he had to live separately. And his son took over the rule of the kingdom. His son was the, people that had inter the person who had to interact with people. Verse 22. Now, the rest of the acts of Uzziah from first to last, Isaiah the prophet, son of Amoz, wrote... And Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belonged to the kings, for they said, He is a leper. And Jotham his son reigned in his place. 
It's important that Uzziah, that Isaiah, not Uzziah, sorry, that Isaiah the prophet is listed by the writer as, of Chronicles as a, as a source for information about Uzziah. Because as we read in our initial reading when we started off here, Isaiah 6, um, we see that the prophet Isaiah became a prophet during the reign of Uzziah. And he receives a vision of the Lord that emphasizes his holiness. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 6, we're going to spend the rest of our time there. Isaiah 6, verse 1 to 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, and that links us right to the story, of course, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And now we get this image of our holy God. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And the one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I wish I had a little sound effect thing that could just make this place rumble as I said that. Because it says there in verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. I can only imagine it. The prophet Isaiah saw this incredible vision of the Lord on his throne in that astonishing glory with heavenly angels, which were called seraphim, calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Now, whenever something is repeated in Scripture, this is a basic premise of Scripture, the repetition always emphasizes it. When we emphasize something, we say God is incredibly holy, amazingly holy, awesomely holy. For them, they just repeated it. And three times repetition is very unusual, and it's the highest degree of emphasis. You don't get any more than that in Scripture. God, these angels, sorry, are declaring God as three times holy. The whole vision of splendor and greatness illustrates how God is set apart in the magnificence of who he is. Like Isaiah, though, we need to see God's holiness. Just like Isaiah, we need to see God's holiness. We need to understand his splendor, his greatness, the fact that he is set apart, that he is so pure, that he is clean. Basically, we need to recognize God for who he is, for who he has revealed himself to be, who he has shown himself to be to us. We need to set aside any notions of our own that don't match who God shows himself to be. So how do we react to God's holiness? Well, let's see how Isaiah reacted. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. The King James says, for I am undone. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. For I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's a very healthy reaction to God's holiness. The contrast between who God is and who we are should overwhelm us. We need to recognize our sin. We need to confess our sin like Isaiah did. That's what he did. He confessed his sin. Now for him, he said it was his lips. It was the knowledge of what he said that he said made him unclean. And if you think about it, um, the, when we, the, the things we say reflect what's inside us. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've said things that were unclean before the Lord, things that hurt people and things like that. It's hard to control our tongues. And for him, that's what stuck out in his mind. This was his sin. And when we see that God is holy and we are not, God would like to draw us to him in confession and repentance, not drive us away. When we see that incredible vision of who he is, God doesn't want to drive us away with it. He wants us to see us for ourselves for who are, we are, he for who he is, but for us to go to him in that confession and repentance. The reason it should drive us to God, though, is God himself. Look what happens in verse 6 in reaction. Then one of the seraphim flew, uh, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. God took the initiative. Isaiah just looked at God and says, oh, 
I'm an unclean man, I'm a sinful man, I'm a guilty man. And God took the initiative to deal with the source of the problem, the guilt of our sin. He dealt with it. Now for Isaiah, this was kind of a temporary solution. He had a burning coal put on his lips to clean him. But the point is God himself takes away our guilt. The tabernacle and the priests that we looked at earlier were also temporary. But they still made a way for people to access the holy, our holy God. You could go to the temple. You could have a consecrated priest sacrifice on your behalf. And God would see your faith and grant you repentance. Now, of course, God sent a permanent solution, didn't he? Jesus, for our guilt problem. And this is something that when you think about who God is, it's pretty unfathomable as well. The same holy God who can't be in the presence of what is unclean and sinful, became a man, Jesus Christ, who lived among us, loved us, taught us about God. Jesus, the perfect, holy Son of God, then allowed himself to be crucified like a criminal, but he became a sacrifice on our behalf, taking the punishment that our sin deserves on himself and then rising from the dead in victory over death. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, And he, <coughs> excuse me, and God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became sin. He became the sin offering for us. Which if you think about it, is um, incredible. Jesus as holy God would actually take our sin on himself and for us. That is pretty incredible love. When we see God's holiness in our own sin and turn from our sin, putting our faith and our trust in Jesus' sacrifice for us, God forgives us and takes away that guilt and makes us his own. He even calls us something that means holy ones. The word is saints. We are all considered saints, holy ones by God because he made us that through Jesus Christ. So that, what then do we do as God's forgiven children? Well, we follow him. We obey him. Look what Isaiah did. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Now that Isaiah knows he's forgiven, that he's accepted by God, he serves him. He volunteers. He goes. The next step after we're forgiven is to follow him in obedience. It's the same exactly for us. Holy God asks us, now that we are holy, set apart by God as his children, to serve him, to live for him, to live a life pleasing to him in every way. And also, like Isaiah, to go. To go to other people around us, to help them understand who holy God is. That he is pure, righteous, and just, and yet loving. So what is your reaction to the God who is holy Holy, holy. Does he frighten you? Does he make you angry, maybe? Does he seem unreachable because of that holiness? Or hopefully, like Isaiah, does his, does his holiness turn, help you turn from your sin to the Lord for his forgiveness, for his reconciliation? Because that's what God really wants. He wants to know us personally and have us with him forever in heaven. So... And then, of course, that's why he sent Jesus. God's holiness should also drive us to holy, righteous living ourselves. In Leviticus, God's, the Father said to uh, Moses, you should be holy because I am holy. And that's repeated in the New Testament. But through the Holy Spirit that God gives us, we can live a life pleasing to the Lord. We can do that. God also, of course, wants to be known for who he really is. That he is holy, that he is set apart above absolutely everything. He is set apart in all that he is, in his purity. He is set apart in his goodness, in his righteousness, in his justice. And above everything else, he is set apart in his love. That's why he doesn't just destroy us. Because of his love that is so huge. And that's what makes our eternity with him possible. And our daily lives can be an offering to him. And because of who he is, he deserves, of course, our worship and our devotion now and 
forever. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I hope in some way, through my feeble lips and and whatever, Father, my speaking, that your spirit has worked to show us something of your incredible uh, holiness and what that means and what it means to us personally, Father, that first of all, we would worship you and we would worship you because we have come to you in, in repentance and you have cleansed us and you've made us your own. You've literally made us holy ones. I can't imagine that to be classed along with you in some way because we know ourselves and we don't live holy lives. But Father, help us to do that. Help us to live in ways that are pleasing to you. Father, help us to love you as our holy God. Help us love each other as fellow followers, fellow holy ones. And help us love the world around us that don't know you, that don't know who you are. And that perhaps we can, you can use us to help us to show people who you are and your great love for them. So thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.